My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And dude, we have a special treat in the house uh, today, man. The great Ralph Bakshi, animator, cartoonist, director, auteur, responsible for a million cool animated titles, man. Uh, the Spider-Man with, with the famous theme song, that's Ralph. Uh, Fritz the Cat director, that's my dad's favorite, uh, Bakshi <laughs> flick in, in uh, the filmography. Wizards, American Pop, what am I leaving on the table, Jimmy? Cool World. Lord of the Rings, one of the first Lord of the Rings adaptations. Um, Fire and Ice with Frazetta. Before we begin, I want to uh, thank Maui Comic Con. This was originally going to take place at Maui Comic Con 2020. Unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID crisis, that convention has been canceled, uh, but we want to draw some attention to them. They are a 501c3 nonprofit, and they are collecting donations to basically uh, continue to hold their annual convention in Maui. Uh, you can follow them on Instagram at Maui Comic Con. You can find their page on Facebook. Maui Comic Con. Um, so again, thank you very much to the organizers of Maui Comic Con for putting us in touch with Ralph Bakshi. And uh, if you're watching this, you know, do yourself a favor and follow them online. So when we were compiling our notes and uh, getting ready to have this conversation, um, fascinating career. And the way it reads, in a, in a, when, when you look at, you know, some of the brief bi biographies, it's like you went from wiping dust off of animation cells to be in the head of uh, Paramount Animation. Something tells me there were some steps before and in between there, and hopefully we can fill in those gaps today. Well, I have one question for that time period. You okay. started at Terry Tunes, I believe, and Gene yeah. Deitch was the head director Dyche. there. Deitch, Dyche. I'm sorry, yes. Um, do you have any stories about, about Mr. Deitch? I used to follow Deitch around when I first got to Terry Tunes. First of all, I'm a very strange guy, it turns out, but I didn't know that at the time, so. Uh, I used to follow Deitch, Deitch around in the afternoons because basically I wanted to learn. I was painting cells, but I made my quota. We had a quota we had to hit every day, 30 or 40 cells. And once that was done, you were pretty much on your own. In a sense, it, it was non-said, but you could relax. So I used to follow Deitch around so I could hear how he talks to the other artists. And he kept looking over his shoulder at me, never knew who I was. He wasn't. Then he thought I was a spy for the boss of Bill Weiss. <laughs> so he finally told someone that Sparky, the production manager, who was that guy following me? So they sat me down. I never followed him again. But that was very funny. Uh, Daesh made a big mistake. Um, when I got to Terry's, I automatically, for some reason, fell in love with the older cartoonists, the guys that were in their 50s and 60s who had been there all the time, Jim Tyre, Connie Rosinski, great cartoonists. From, from my, you know, from my perspective, Deitch, and, when Deitch came to Terry Toons, his job was to go UPA modern. UPA was a craze. That was the only way to go. You know, that was designers, Jewel Pfeiffer. Um, and the older guys were just thrown aside. It was a very tough time. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a very tough time for, for me and the guys. I love the old cartoonists. I thought they were real cartoonists. I wasn't too sure about the, the new design, and I certainly wasn't too sure about the stories these designs were saying. So um, um, I told Deitch that, and he didn't appreciate it. So, um, um, But that's Deitch ran around a lot. He was, he, that was the only mistake he made. Those guys were great. Had he gone with those guys? Um, I think you would have done much better. I've also lost your faces. Yeah, we wanted we wanted you front and front and center, oh, oh, and whenever we we'll talk, we'll, we'll pop up like that. You were gone. You were gone. I we're, like, pro the <laughs> we're producing on the fly. Okay, um, Ralph. Whenever you whenever you were a kid in high school, you studied cartooning. Then was there an actual curriculum in the uh, Manhattan School of Industrial Art? Well, let me tell you what happened. I was. I went to a neighborhood school, which was Thomas Jefferson High in Brownsville. I graduated junior high. I had gone to Thomas Jefferson. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I loved comic books very, very much, uh, but I had no idea that, that, that somebody could draw them. I'm serious. Um, so I went to school, got into a lot of trouble in the first week, had to see the principal twice. Um, and in one of the meetings, he told me, I told him I could draw, which was just a lie. 
And he told me about this test that was being taken in the high school of industrial arts for latecomers. The, the school started the curriculum in the eighth grade or ninth grade. I was already in, in my sophomore in high school, so I missed a year. So late test. So I told him I could take I want to take it. So he, they set it up. I took it to Manhattan, which was a, uh, in a large auditorium. It was what the high school of industrial arts was, was a vocational high school that taught with real professionals, cartooning, illustrations, camera, all this other kind of stuff. Um, by, by professionals, it was a dynamite grade school, I found out once I got there. Anyway, I passed the test, and they let me in. I was stunned. It was very far in, in, in Manhattan. I had to get up very early in the morning and take a subway there an hour, an hour back at night. It, it was very difficult. But yes, it was a professional art school. My art teacher was a, was a, my cartooning teacher was a guy called Charles Allen, who was a black cartoonist, um, a professional. And during World War, could not get any work uh, before World War II started. But when World War II started, all the guys were drafted, so he was ghosting a lot of famous strips at that time. All in the family, all kinds of strips. Of course, this was after World War II now. This was in the 50s when I entered the school, 53 or 54. And he told me these wonderful stories. But he was such a great cartoonist, and he taught me an awful lot about the comic strips, which is what I wanted to be. He also spoke to me about the injustice that he went through, and I guess later, and that really registered with me, because later on, I did some films about that in the film called The uh, Coonskin and Heavy Traffic uh, and Wizards. I spoke a lot about what, what man does to man. And I think Charles Allen uh, woke me up to what was going on in the world. You have to understand I was basically a very uh, uneducated kid from Brooklyn, Brownsville, this is my first time in Manhattan. I mean, the school, I never was in Manhattan before. So the whole thing worked out very well. It, I won the cartoony medal, and I got me the job at Terry Jones. So the whole thing worked out for me. I, I love Charles Allen. He was a great cartoonist. Um, and he taught me a lot about what, what it means to be a cartoonist. One of the things he told me was very interesting in class that I really respected. Uh, EC Comics was doing a very... Was, had just come out, was doing an awful lot of work, and Jack Davis was one of the great EC artists of all time. And one of the kids in school uh, used to copy his style for Sunday pages and do his own comic strips in Jack Davis's style perfectly. And he used to bring it to class, and all the other kids started laughing at him and pointing at it to rip off. And Alan stood up and said, if you think it's easy to do what he did, then why don't you try it? <laughs> meaning that it's very hard what he did, and it's very excellent. Um, and also, everyone kind of copied other cartoonists anyhow. But he taught me that it was in working hard. That was a very fair thing to say. Um, I like that. It made sense to me, and it made the kids feel better. Um, no one ever taunted him again. And he hit sensational. It was, it was as good as Jack Davis. That's not easy. So uh, school was great. School, school taught me a lot. So you went from comic strips, uh, but then into a career in animation. What what are the steps to get you to that place? Uh, starvation. Poverty. <laughs> <laughs> I got a job at Terry Tunes, and, you know, there's money. It was like 60 or 70 bucks a week. I've never made money before. We were very, you have to understand, I come from a poor immigrant family. I don't consider that a hindrance. It never bothered me. But I didn't have any money. We didn't have much to talk about. So 65 bucks a week was an enormous amount of money in those days. Um, I took a job at an animation company because it was a cartoon studio. Um, it paid me money, and I could always do comic strips at night. That was the plan. Um, when I got into animation, I, I used to paint paint cells and polish cells. But I used to spend a lot of time walking around looking at what the guys were doing. Now, Terry Tunes was great because it was considered the worst studio in the business by everybody. In other words, if you talk about studios and, and 
who's first and who's second. Everyone in the industry knew that said that Terry Tunes was last. Um, and that was for me the greatest thing in the world because first of all, I didn't know and I didn't care. Secondly, in Terry Tunes, you had a right to fail. You see, what's great about places like Terry Tunes that don't exist anymore was a guy like me who was very untutored, had only two and a half years of art school, you know, was allowed to work full time, make mistakes, but not get fired because the studio was so bad, no one cared. Plus the cartoonists in the studio were just cartoonists. I mean, all they wanted to do was come in, draw, have lunch, draw, go home. These were the greatest guys in the world. You know, they weren't trying to be great Disney animators. They weren't trying to change the face of animation. They just loved what they were doing. And that love that they, that they had taught me everything I had to know about the rest of my life. If you don't love what you're doing, don't do it. So Terry Tunes, which was the worst place in the world to everyone, was the best place in the world to learn. They don't have that today where kids have a time to learn their trade, watch their craft slowly, watch professionals do it, um, and get better. You know, right now you're either in, you're great, or you're out. I mean, uh, studios today have guys in rooms. They don't talk to each other. It's all very different. Of course, everything is very different in America today. But I love Terry Tunes, and I learned an awful lot by, by being allowed to learn if you wanted to learn. I mean, the point with learning is you've got to work very hard to learn. If you want to go out at lunch and not look at what the guys were drawing, well, you do that. But if you want to, at lunchtime, sneak drawings out of their waste paper baskets and study at home, which I did from the animators, um, uh, you did that and you took their rough home and you learned what a rough is and what a rough could be. Um, all of that was there. Um, what was also there was the, the biggest collection of children's books in the world I have. Now, why do I have the biggest collection of children's books in the entire world was another Gene Dyke story. So I'm walking around and I'm, there's a story department there and all these books are on the floor and on the shelves. Over the years at Terry Tunes, they had bought all these children's books, you know, for, for research and stuff that they were doing their cartoons. But these books were all Arthur Rackham, the great Victorian illustrators, you know, all these hacks that weren't UPA, according to Deitch. I'm not putting Deitch down. Everybody was thinking that way. So I said, Gene, could I take the books? He said, gladly, get rid of them, take them. So I piled in my car all those great Victorian illustration, you know, Flying the Islands of the Night, Heath Robinson. So I have in these, in these bookshelves behind me somewhere all those books. I found the first edition, Heinrich Klei, published in Germany. All this was considered crap. Uh, isn't that amazing? Um, um, uh, somehow, because I was old-fashioned from the Stettel and Brownsville, I love the old stuff. I mean, old stuff has character. As you remember, Fiddler on the Roof, tradition. The new stuff didn't have any tradition. It was just very very slick. It was very designy, very hip. Uh, told very boring stories. UPA told some of the most boring, made some of the most boring cartoons in the world that were brilliantly designed, but absolutely boring. You know, I would take a Max Fleischer cartoon in 10 seconds over anything that Disney cartoons did or UPA did. As a matter of fact, it's my favorite cartoonist is Max Fleischer, um, who put everything and his soul in New York City into his cartoons. Um, he also taught me a lot. Would you get these animation jobs uh, by using your comic strip work as a portfolio? Or did you have some experience with that while in school? Animation? Well, the only experience we had in school in animation, which was very silly when I got to the studio, was we had a... They gave us a week each. Each, each, <laughs> each title had a, had a had deadline. So we had to produce one animated cell in color, which means you had to do a drawing, you had to get it ink, and you had to put paint on paper on, on the cell to get it. We sweated and strained, and we <laughs> and we died. And we got one cell, we thought we were God, and we ran up with it. Uh, um, that's all we did. When I got to animation, now I didn't use my comic strips. I never got the comic strips. I just drew them 
but I never showed them to anybody. I got my job at Terry Tunes by getting the cartoon medal um, at my school. The next next job I got was at Paramount Pictures about 10 or 12 years later where I, where I ran the joint. I never had to show a portfolio to anyone. No, like I never had. No one ever saw a comic strip of mine. Thank God. I was looking at my strips that I collected the other day. I was cleaning out my library behind me, and I found all these you know strips I had bought on um, paper, the actual newspaper strips, you know, collections of V.T. Hamlin and all these great cartoonists that I love and G.R. Williams. And I looked at the amount of work these guys did in and day. My mouth dropped open at how hard they must have been working um, to produce this day in and day out. You know, in animation, you take a break at lunch. Um, so anyhow, animate, comic script is a very beautiful but very difficult profession. I never got even close to it because I just loved animation or got very lucky at it um, or a combination of both. Yeah. Ralph, when we look at your, your career, um, nobody has a career like yours, but you start out you know, cleaning cells and things and just skipping lunch so you can study these great cartoonists that are around you. No one else seems to do that. I wonder if uh, if you look back, if you reflect on, you know, what what made you do those things, you know, that are pretty atypical uh, compared to other people where you just, was it just the love or, you know, did you get that hard work from your parents? Um, what's, a, uh, what's a very, that's a very good question. Um, a couple of things. First of all, immigrants have a whole different me mental set. If you're coming, if you're fleeing the Nazis, which my mother and father were doing, coming to America, to a land that is, you don't know what is going on, you have to work very hard to, to earn a living to keep the family um, alive. In other words, uh, it was very hard. My, both my mother, my mother worked in the garment center, and my father worked in a steel shop, um, and yet we still were considered poor. Um, so the work ethic was very important. Secondly, you learn as I learned in my house as a young man: if you don't break your neck working hard, you don't get anywhere. So hard from same thing with learning baseball. When I wanted to be a baseball player, I threw a ball against the wall for hours just to get my curve working or my slider working. So the only way for me to learn or to get better was to just do it and do it again. Um, now, did I, I absolutely love cartooning. I mean, when I was a young kid, I used to go in trash cans, but you couldn't, we couldn't afford a dime for a comic, a new comic book. I used to go to trash cans throughout the neighborhood to find comic books that were thrown out. That's how much I love comic books. I could not wait to get sick, you know, so I, my mother would be forced to buy me a comic book, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I love the medium so much I can't explain. It wasn't what I also learned and what I guess I'm telling anyone that might be listening to this is if you love something, it's not work. If you don't like it, it's work. So it's, so I didn't get animated feet that would bore me to tears, that would be work. If I was doing heavy traffic, I absolutely loved writing about the city. I could go around the clock all night, but that's not work. So if you find something you love, including a woman, I mean, it's not work at all. So what other guys did uh, during lunch um, was beyond my understanding, uh, not following um, Gene Deitch around, I could not understand why he learned so much in just the way he lied to these guys. And, <laughs> and um, you're talking to old cartoonists about their lives. I was very interested in where they came and what they did and what, what drawing is all about. That was part of just loving the medium. I met a guy many years later, a great comic book artist called Joe Cubitt. Um, Joe Cubitt was from Poland. He was also a uh, an immigrant, and we spoke, and he lived about five blocks from my house. He was 10 years older than me, but we, he too is the same way. He loved cartooning so much in comic strips, he never stopped. While all the comic book artists were walk, walking around, 
bitching about the low salaries and how hard the work was and the page rates. Nothing bothered Joe. He just kept going and loved every bit of it. He became, at the end, one of the great uh, comic strip artists, as far as I'm concerned, of all time. Because, But that came from this love, this ghetto love of what you're doing, as opposed to hating something. You'll never get good if you hate something. I wouldn't bother doing animation if I didn't like it. And a lot of the guys in the studios I worked for didn't like it. It was just too much work. It was too hard. It was blah, blah, blah. And if you're a Terry Tunes, you didn't have the Disney aura around you of being great. You were just a schlep. You, you, you were embarrassed even working at Terry Tunes. I found that to be a, um, a horror show. Um, um, when, I, when I got to direct at Terry Tunes, I hired all the old guys to work for me. I didn't go near any of the new kids. I didn't like that design. I wanted drawings that had um, punch to it, flavor, honesty. If it wasn't drawn that well, what did that matter? That never mattered to me how well you drew. It's only how honestly you drew. I'm still that way today. My films aren't drawn the greatest. They're not the greatest looking films in the world. But that's why they got finished. Because I didn't care. It wasn't about the drawing or how great it was compared to Disney. It's about what are you saying in the cartoon and how much do you love what you're doing? How much you love the animation, even if it's bad? If you love it, something is going to come through. That's the way I was. Um, uh, that'll work for me. That'll work for me very well. And, um, um, it kept me away from doing commercial garbage that would have bored me to tears and um, forced me to drink. <laughs> I heard an I interview where you talked about, you know, style being one of the important choices as a storyteller, you know, in animation. And it stood out to me. I think about that a lot in the comics that I make, you know, making that style line up. And it sounds a little bit like what you're describing when you talk about, you know, honest drawings being important to you. Uh, is that, do you see that related to that idea of style and trying to, you know, make those drawings connect with that story? Um. Okay, this is, this is tricky because, um, yes, that's another good question. Um, as when I was at Ted, style was everything. The UPA style, commercials were being done. Every, Gene Deitch was about style. Everything was about style. It wasn't about content. In other words, if you that style would somehow make what you're drawing interesting. Um, so most part what you were drawing wasn't as important as what style it was drawn in and so many designers got jobs and it was always about style every time you did something uh, a different picture was done in a different style um okay and that's how i grew up i tried many different styles uh, i i worked with many different designers paul coker all kinds of people um then along comes and as okay but before that during that period, I was assisting. I had gone from painting cells to uh, being an assistant animator. And I had chosen to be an assistant animator to the only animator in the place that nobody wanted to work with. As a matter of fact, every animator and director in the place wanted to fire him. This animator was named Jim Tyre. Now, Jim Tyre is one of the great all-time expressionist animators in the history of art. If anyone wants to see Jim Tyre's work is like, you go to YouTube. The reason nobody fired Jim Tyre was because he was the fastest man in the studio, and he could do so much footage a week, the boss did not want to fire him because it was he did the cheapest animation in the place. You know, that's good for a low-budget, small studio. Jim Tyre taught me very carefully that everything moves, Ralph. Do not worry about moving it. Just move it and have fun. Everything distorts. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just have a ball of what you're doing, and it, that'll come through. That, that was Jim's words to me, and that's how we animated. Um, what did that teach me? That taught me everything. In other words, um, by the time I got to design my own films, the kind of films I was trying to make were city ghetto films, like hey, Heavy Traffic, Fritz the Cat, Hey Good Looking. So my, the cornball 
style, which I love very much. And by the way, let me mention another cartoonist I love very much in high school was Bill Malden uh, up front. He taught me a lot. Um, so the style I eventually picked was my style. In other words, I, you know, when I'm doing low budget animation, I don't have the kind of staffs that Disney has um, and the other feature film studios have. With every kid, an animator in America says, unless you have a full story department, full color department, full concept department, full departments of everything, you can't do the feature. I had no departments at all. Most of the storyboards came off of my desk. Most of the character designs I started as cartoon doodles. They went to other animators who I liked their drawing, who either cleaned them up or, or made them perfect. Um, so my the style that I eventually picked was the style that I could that I could draw in, because I didn't have the money or the luxury, luckily, to go out and hire all these fancy people to draw what they felt my my picture was like, and in drawing what they felt my picture was like, it probably would not look right. In other words, I knew how my picture should look instinctively, because I knew what I was I was drawing personal stuff. Now if you're doing I did that that changed on, on Lord of the Rings uh, because I wasn't myself. I didn't quite I did not quite enjoy rotoscope, but it was the only way for me to do the film. Um, so style to me was about your own personal drawing. Um, and again, everything mostly you know, but of course I gave up big money um, and all kinds of uh, high budget so I can do my low budget films that nobody really thought were commercial. You have to understand that was an act. I knew what I was doing. In other words, after Fritz the Cat, I could have done Fritz the Cat 2, 3, and 4. I would have been a millionaire right after 4. But I turned down Fritz the Cat sequel. It was done by somebody else um, to do Heavy Traffic because Heavy Traffic was the next step for me. You see, so um, but to sell those kind of dangerous pictures to studios, uh, to have a budget that's so low, they say, ah, why not, we'll give it to them. It's exactly their attitude. I know they were doing, and because it was such a low budget, with no very big actors in it, they didn't have to come over and even take, see what it looked like. They didn't care what it looked like, it was just so cheap. So I was able to do whatever I wanted in it. That was all plotted and planned. That's, see, that's Brooklyn smart. That's where I grew up in the streets. If they, if they told me anything, well, that's it. So I knew uh, it was harder that way. I gave up a lot of personal money, but I made out okay. My wife saved every penny I made. She was great. <laughs> um, just so I could do my films the way I wanted to, because I knew they wouldn't care. I even handed in stri uh, scripts to them that would that were kind of lies as to what the film was really about. You know, they because I, I made sure every script of mine sounded really funny, like Fritz. Um, uh, put into them whatever I wanted to, because they never cared. Um, um, they never cared to look. They're always shocked when they saw it, though. I always, I always, when I screened the film for them, was ready for the for the screen and the yelling, and the cursing and the suing. I always told my lawyer. I would tell my lawyer, get ready, I'm screening my crew. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These are true. That's my daughter asking me if I'm on this. <laughs> I'm on it, I'm doing it. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, Fritz the Cat, and uh, you know, Robert Crumb famously is not into the movie, to say the, the least. Uh, right. But when you watch the flick, I feel like it's fairly uh, faithful. So, like, what do you have some sense of what his issues were with the animation or whatever? Oh, I, 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 I knew you were going to ask that. Everyone wants to know that, but but you are sensible, so I'll give you the truth from my point of view. First of all, I don't care what Robert Crumb. First of all, Robert Crumb is a very talented cartoonist. That said, um, I don't care what he thinks. In other words, I took a twenty-five thousand page book that I found in the East Village called Fritz the Cat, which I like, and to sell as the first adult I made it feature. In other words, I knew what I was coming out of Paramount. I just fi finished um, Spider-Man series, but I wanted to go with that. 
that was that was something I wanted to do. I wanted to be an adult animation guy because that would only be the way I could do stuff that I wanted to do, that I loved. But I also knew that motion picture companies needed a property to look at. So if I bought the book and brought it into a meeting and held it up, or had a produce with me, Steve Kranz, by the way, that they didn't care that 25,000, I omitted the fact that only 25,000 issues were sold. I said, I, the comic book, I want to make it. Okay. So that's what Heavy Traffic was my second picture. It was too forward thinking, even for me to do it for Fritz, which was still animals and cute um, and about New York. Um, okay, so uh, Crum had the right to come down and work with me. He refused, which was I was fine with. Okay, and he never showed up on production. What were his issues? He made fifty thousand dollars from Steve Krantz, which was a ton of money for a starving underground cartoonist for the rights for the first picture. He got fifty thousand dollars for the rights for Steve Grant for the second picture. He got $3 million in profits from the first picture, and yet he pitched at me. But I tell you, why he pitched at me is because I don't know what he was thinking about. In film, the director and the writer, and the guy has crea created a front on the front, the front of the movie. Nobody was hiding Crumb, created by Robert Crumb. Um, but he didn't understand that in the motion picture business, I think this is what he felt. He did not understand in the motion picture business that the director and writer of a movie is the creator, is the big shot. Most directors in the business always got other properties from other, whether it's books or plays and to make their movies from. 95% of all those other guys that got those other properties the guys that got the properties from all hated what the director did with their property because it's not their property. But what I think was, but I can't be right about this, but I'm not that far wrong about it because Crumb, okay, um, maybe he thought, maybe just got angry at all the publicity I was getting, which surprised me too. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, the picture wasn't bad at the budget. It certainly got the audiences crazy. It certainly made Robert Crumb famous to millions of people that never knew him. I mean, um, the book sales on Fritz the Character that shot up to four or five hundred thousand. The comic book that I bought at twenty-five thousand. I did. The family made a fortune. His wife called me many times and thank God blessed me for the money that we were sending them. So, you know, Robert Crumb and. Um, so I really don't care what he thinks. What I'm saying is, you ask me what happened. I have no idea, except that's the story. You can make your own decisions on why he did that. Um, I happen to think, knowing Crumb, and I knew him very well, I hung out with Crumb and all, all those guys in San Francisco. I mean, Crumb wasn't a stranger to me. Matter of fact, at one point, I had every Crumb sketchbook in my house, big drawings that he loaned me uh, that were just beautiful to look at. So I don't know. I think it has to do somewhat with that, his character. What what am I doing cutting in? But he didn't understand the business I was in, which is the feature film business. I think that's basically it. Um, you know, Will Eisner and a lot of cartoonists, even though other guys draw their stuff, still get the credit for what they do. I think it's somewhere in there. Uh, I'm not going to discuss Crumb's film that he did on his own life. Uh, that would be nasty of me, which I dislike tremendously. Um, but that would be the story. I, I don't, I've spoken to Crumb over the years. Sometimes he picks up the phone and talks to me. Sometimes he doesn't want to see me ever again. So, um, But whether he liked it, did, did not like the film, is I could care less. I loved sure. the film, and I loved what it did for animation, and I loved that it got me to heavy traffic. Um, I think if Crumb was nicer to me, I, I might have done. Um, he never talks about Fritz, the nine lives of Fritz the Cat. He only blames me for, for his Fritz. But the nine lives of Fritz the Cat is unviewable. It's one of the worst animated features I've ever seen. So that's what Crumb would have gotten on his first feature if I wasn't doing it. 
you know. So, but that's never mentioned. Crumb never mentions heavy traffic. Hey, good looking American pop. Like I never made those films, you know. Um, um, my, you know, the other guy I really wanted to do a movie with. There were two other underground cartoonists that Crumb crushed their chances for because I got so depressed. I was depressed at the time, um, and he got so many other cartoonists hating me. Everyone, you know, everyone's jumping on Crumb's bandwagon. All the critics, blah blah blah. Uh, Spain Rodriguez and Vaughn Bodie were the two great cartoonists, and I would have done features with their stuff. As a matter of fact, with Vaughn and I had a script together before he before he died. We were going to do the, the Amoris, the Amoris Adventures of Puck. He wrote a script. I was going to direct it. He designed the characters, of course. Uh, I have returned the script to his son last year because I'm never going to make the film when I was born. It's an hysterical film. Uh, another <laughs> uh, cartoonist that uh, that you're associated with it at times is uh, the great uh, Frank Frazetta. You know, you mentioned baseball earlier. He's like the famous baseball play-in uh, cartoonist. I, I'm looking on your shelves back there. My eyes always gravitate toward those EC hardcovers, and I see I see two volumes uh, behind <laughs> your your left. Um, okay. How did you how did you gain association with uh, Frazetta, and what was that relationship like? It was sensational. Okay, so Frank. Frank's about 10 years older than me, maybe a little less. I'm running around Brooks. First of all, when I got to art school, okay, the, the high, this is interesting, the High School of Industrial Arts, Frank Frazetta's name, though I never saw anything he did, was already buzzing around. I think at that point he had done maybe uh, the Buck Rogers covers, okay? So everyone heard of this, this, this kind of a magic, mystical guy that's Frazetta. In fact, there's a brilliant artist in class um, that drew Germans, uh, soldiers, brilliantly in a very fine pencil. He, I thought he was Frazetta, so I asked him. He wasn't. Okay. So, but I knew Frazetta lived somewhere in Brooklyn. Okay. Now I'm hanging out. Now I'm doing um, I'm doing presentations at Terry Two, then at Paramount with artists that I want to do presentations with, which is Joe Cubitt, Gray Morrow, a Wally Wood. Uh, and I, I, I asked Gray Morrow, I was at his house one day looking at his pictures. I asked him what he knows about Frank. He says, well, I'm talking to him on the phone in five minutes. So he's talking to Frank, and then he, Gray gives me the phone and says, this is Ralph Bax, she wants to talk to you. So I talk to Frank, we talk about Brooklyn, and then I find out uh, uh, that he plays stickball. Bang. Now, stickball is my game. I am the greatest stickball player that the history of Brownsville has ever seen. I have never lost a stickball game on my block. All my friends despise me. I have never done anything but been sensational in stickball. Now, I tell Frank that. I said, you son of a bitch. I said, this is who I am. He says, oh, yeah? No, forget it. Oh, yeah? Where are you going to play me? He says, I'm coming down tomorrow to your... <laughs> I'm coming down tomorrow to your schoolyard, which is where we play stickball. He was there. He beat me the first game. I beat him the second game. He could not believe it. No one had ever beat Frank Frazetta in stickball. Let me tell you about Frazetta. He says, look at this, Ralph. He shows me this. This is the first day I meet him. He has a Spalding, you know, a light, a Spalding rubber ball. Across the street from the schoolyard is a gigantic, old-fashioned, medieval Victorian school, public school, red bricks, arching windows, maybe five or six stories high. He, he takes a running leap and throws this Spalding impossibly on the roof of the billboard of the school. That's impossible. No one in the history of the world could do that. He did that. He was so fast on his feet. He was such a brilliant artist. He told me many a time. I got along sensational. He, he was from Brooklyn. He liked what I liked. I beat him in stickball. That was enough to send him <laughs> to send him into ecstasy. No one had ever beat him. Um, um, we liked the same artists. Um, 
he told me it many times, Ralph, I don't know how I do it. I don't know how I do it. I draw it. Because I just sit down and it comes out. Frankie should sit down in the candy store with um, uh, and look at a Bridgman, you know, the, the art of the Bridgman anatomy book with Crink, right. Crink, Roy Crinkle, who told me this about Frank. I didn't see that. But Crinkle was also a good friend of mine who was a great friend of Frank's. And when Crinkle taught Frank all about sword and sorcery, in fact, it's Crinkle that gave Frank Crinkle doing pocket books for Ace, and it's Crinkle that gave Frank his overflow of pocket book covers he could not do to do. And that's how suddenly Frank's covers appeared on Ace, and he was, it, they were an instant smash. So without Crinkle, we don't know. But Frank wasn't the greatest salesman in the world either. In other words, he didn't like going around trying to sell this stuff. He was very casual. He starved many a year because he was just easy. And now he told me he doesn't know how he does it. He, Crinkle says he looked at Bridgman one day in the candy store with him. The entire book, he went through it every page, closed the book, looked at Crinkle and says, I got it. And he had it. So uh, he was a remarkable genius um, who also painted emotionally. He also told me he didn't, he, I say, Frank, why don't you ever use models or anything? He says, Ralph, it's done. If you use a model, it's done. It's all finished for you. Why bother? Why bother drawing it? So for him, drawing realistically was boring because it was all finished. The minute he looked at it, he could do it. What he needed was a challenge and motion of distortion. Like so much of his stuff is distorted beautifully the right way. Um, so I related to that too. So that's another, so you're always learning from other artists. Look at all the things you learn from Frank. Ralph, it's there, why bother? Well, you know, right, that's Jim Tyre again. If it distorts and bounces around, it's funnier. Um, so me and Frank got along well. I was with him when he got very, we were doing fire and ice when he got very sick and ill. Um, and I spent a lot of time with him going to hospitals and things. Um, uh, he got very, it was very, very difficult for him. He could draw, he had strokes at the end. Um, he, he could draw with his right hand, because he had a stroke. He learned how to draw with his left hand. There, you know, that's the kind of guy, you know, he wouldn't give up. Um, uh, the kind of paintings he did at the end was with his left hand. And you can't tell the difference. Um, but this is a man who switched hands and taught himself to draw with his so it was very difficult um, at the end. Um, we had a lot of fun on Fire and Ice. We loved casting on Fire and Ice. He showed stuntmen how to do their stunts. I really loved that. He would show guys. So we shot the picture rotoscope through so a live action stuntmen running around. He showed them how to run up walls and down walls and everything. And he wasn't a kid. He was probably in his 50s. Right? Um, at any rate, he was a very special person. Ralph, I, I read that. Frank, yeah, I like the guy. Go ahead. I, I read that um, a layout artist on Fire and Ice was Peter Chung, who went on yes. to do some some cartoons I like. You know, Aeon Flux is what I always think of yes. with him. Do you remember working with him and, and any any distinct memories of his work? Clear as a bell. Oh, clear as a bell. Funny you should know it knows that Chung. That's clear as a bell. I hired Chung. He came in from art school. Um, I hired Chung. His drawing is were very much Toulouse of Trek inspired, but absolutely exquisite. He drew beautifully, and I gave him the storyboards to do on the end of the picture where these guys riding um, winged creatures were attacking inside a cave. Um, uh, and he, the George was absolutely beautiful, but <laughs> uh, he was a very nice, quiet guy, good looking, beautiful dressman, except he hated the studio. He would come to me and he would say, Ralph, this is the most disorganized place I've ever seen in my life. I don't know how you get anything done at any given point. He was, of course, at very precise. And we were kind of, at that point, a little slapstick. It was the end of my career. Um, and he would sit there give me lectures on what I have to do to run a better studio. <laughs> I love the guy. I'm sitting there staring at him. Now, I, not, I can't get mad because I'm not stupid. He's doing some of the best drawings I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he quits before the end of the film. He gets a job somewhere. 
Uh, he comes to me and says, I quit. The place is too disorganized, and I'm leaving. I said, Peter, good luck, but thanks for the drawings. Uh, I'll never forget his drawings. Because, you know, I love drawings, and Chug was sensational. Um, I think he also was a little afraid of Frank. Don't forget that Frank Frazetta on Fire and Ice came to the studio. When Frank used to walk around the studio to show guys how to draw, they could draw. They would faint at their desks. I had the biggest problem in the world is how do I keep people drawing if Frank Frazetta is staring over their shoulder? It never dawned on me. I mean, they froze. Uh, they got so terrified. They couldn't draw a pencil. Frank, every Friday, would bring his original paintings in. He brought them with him so that he wouldn't have to be left in, in where he was living in Pennsylvania so they wouldn't get robbed. So he had his whole apartment house full of Frank Rosetta paintings, which he brought in. And every Friday, the guys would come in in my office and sit there, and Frank would give lectures on these paintings. Now, <laughs> so I think Chung got a little pissed because you know, Chung is very much a go-getter and very much thinks he is as great as he is, and he is great. And I think basically that was hard to take. It was hard for me to take. Was that people would rather talk to Frank than me in my own studio. So, <laughs> so the whole thing, and I, I expected that. Anyhow, uh, Chung was great. Um, I don't know what he did after. Um, um, I think basically um, he could have done something else. At least, I don't know how he was handled. Um, basically, his drawings are absolutely magnificent. Uh, if he stayed close to the Trek, the first thing I saw, which was his, the Trek's museum um, circus drawings. You've got to look at the Trek's circus drawings. That's what I'm talking about. Very after the Trek was sick and crazy, coming out of a sanatorium, he did about 50 drawings to prove he was sane. Those are some of the, the best things he's ever done. You could find them on on eBay or somewhere, or YouTube or Abe's Books. The tricks. Um, so that's what he was drawing like. And um, in a sense, in a sense, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. You know? So I liked Chung a lot. He was very brave to come to my office and tell me I was crap. <laughs> <laughs> when you wrap up a picture, a show, a, a movie, a feature film, uh, what happens to all the assets, all the, the cells, the backgrounds, the sketches, the character designs? Uh, do those go into an archive? Like, what, what happens with that material? <laughs> what do you think happens? I have no idea. I guess some of it goes on, gets leaked out, goes on the market, maybe. Some gets oh, in every production, some gets wrong. There's no question about that. Now, now, how how I glared at everybody, don't you dare rob me. Uh, the stuff gets leaked down, but I kept everything. I was the guy at we sell those cells. My wife has a business. I buy art supplies with it. So let me tell you a story, okay. I took every book off the floor at Terry Toons. I took entire collections of clippings for Life magazine from Terry Toons of T.S. Sullivan that I discovered, old comic strips. I love old comics. I love that stuff. How am I going to throw out the animation? Steve Krentz threw all the first to cat apples that was in my studio. I could not believe it to this day. So I collected everything and dragged it around. My wife has a business with my son and my daughter of selling cells and backgrounds. And that keeps us a, keeps keeps some cash flowing in, especially for art supplies, which have gone through the roof on their costs. Um, but there's no way I could, you could throw that stuff. How could anyone throw that stuff out? How could Warner Brothers throw that stuff out? Let me tell you this true story. So help me God. Um, I'm at Disney. I've been... Um, Disney's brother's, Disney's brother's son, Roy Disney, uh, my, was represented by my lawyer who represented me in all my films. Roy Disney had a son who needed a job. Um, so my lawyer asked me to hire Roy Disney's son in my studio, which I did um, as a favor. He, he did a lot of them jobs. He loved it. Um, but Roy Disney, his father, uh, became my friend because of it. So I was invited to, to uh, Disney during the big transover period when they were going to hire uh, those guys from Paramount, Katzenberg and the next guy. Um, 
it was going through a huge transition period where Disney was going to change how it ran. So I went, so I had lunch with Roy there, and he asked me what he should do. You ready? This is true. What he should do with the archive. I said, what, what are you talking about? What should I do with all those drawings and backgrounds and cells we have downstairs? And he showed me the room, you know. Um, I instantly thought of robbing the whole fucking place. I, I don't know how to get rid of it. I could just take everything out. <laughs> My first thought was, how do I get rid of it? And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he says, we could make an awful lot of money by selling it. They were short of cash in those days because they were having a hard time. It was a, during that transition when they were doing um, very bad movies. Um, all the guys were very old and tired. Walt was dead. Uh, they hadn't changed what they were doing. I was kicking them around with my adult stuff. So, um, at any rate, I said, I told Roy to his face at lunch, if you sell those drawings, you sell your tradition. You sell your history, you sell all your art. I said, it's the stupidest thing you could do. He never sold it. Um, I, I'm, I attribute myself to that. He was going to sell to get the cash. But that's what happens to guys who don't love the animation business. It's just a business to them. It's a good business. It's a bad business. That they don't care what they make. They don't care what the artwork is like. You know, I, you know Frank Frazetta used to be back to Frank. Frank Frazetta took less money for his pictures on covers. You know why? Because he demanded the artwork back. He refused to leave it. All the other cards, all the other pulp guys left their stuff for the most part, with the publisher for a hundred bucks more. Frank took a hundred bucks less a painting so you can get his paintings back. He said to me, Ralph, how could you, how, how could an artist give his paintings away? So you either love what you're doing or you don't love what you're doing. Um, so that was my Roy Disney story with their archives. I've got everything I have, well, except for the pictures at Krantz. Um, because you know, if Krantz took me out of the studio, that's another story. I want to get into that. Um, or I would have had those too. But I got some stuff from traffic. Yeah, I lost Fritz, but I got everything. I also have Roy, also, I also collect Lichty cartoons. I love George Lichty and I love Dennis Wertman. I still buy original cartoon art. There was a, a big collection of Wertman stuff that the uh, James Sturm unearthed, I guess now it's been 15 or 20 years there at the Center for Cartoon Studies. I think they published a book of it, but I think it was because he found like a big pile of original Wortman artwork, if, if memory serves. Here's the story. <laughs> Wortman's son, I spoke to Wortman's son, because I was, Wortman's son had everything Wortman ever done, had done in his house up in Martha's Vineyard somewhere. And I spoke to Wortman's son on the phone. I said, I want to buy some. And we arrived at two or three thousand dollars a cartoon. Um, I said, I'll send you what I like over the email. He says, No, you have to come up and look at it, pick the ones you want. Well, I never got around to it. Um, then I get a call from a cartoon collector um, who tells me that this guy you're talking about had ran into, had gotten the, had, on A Books, on A Books had bought, um, a book that I loved in high school, which was Moby Dick and the Duke Wortman. That book stunned them. And they looked Wortman up and they found Wortman's son. And they talked Wortman's son into, for some reason, maybe economically, what well, I don't know, to uh, donate all their, all of Wortman's cartoons to the school you're talking about. Um, and uh, they called me eventually, asked me if I wanted to buy a couple, which I did. Uh, they let me know they were doing that. Um, they put out the book, which of course I have. Um, I've also got hundreds of loosely books of Metropolitan Movies collections from the original newspapers that I bought on eBay many years ago. I love Wortman very much. Um, uh, Bob Stelsa, that was the collector, who also called me and said that they would because they want to expand their collection, those two guys, they wouldn't trade me originals from my collection so I, um, so I could trade my originals for Wortman's drawings because they wanted to expand their collection. 
I told him I already had 10 or 15 Workman originals, and you're not getting my other stuff. And <laughs> so, you yeah, know, so that's that story. What are the qualities of Wortman's art that you respond to? Oh, look. I love New York. I love old New York. First of all, I'm old. I'm 82. I grew up in the 30s and 40s and 50s. It was a whole different time. I grew up, look at Naked City, the movie, and, and look at some of the film noir films, and look at the old James Cagney films. Wortman had a quality of realism. You see, I'm always back to what I like. You see, you see how the whole thing comes around? Workman had a quality of realism and being on the streets. Workman was in Lower East Side drawing the actual buildings and people. Work, all of Workman's material, a Metropolitan movie, a Mopey Dick and the Duke, came from being on location for real and telling some sort of real truth, which was much different than Smokey Stover and Dick Tracy. You know, um, I loved the Ashcan school of painters. I loved Bellows. I loved uh, my favorite painter was Reginald Marsh, who, who painted Coney Island. I loved John Sloan. Workman was part of that school. He was part of those guys that drew the city and painted the city. In fact, he was their friends also. Um, what I like about Workman is his honesty, his style of sketchiness his realism, his love of the city. You see, he loved the city. He loved Moby Dick and the Duke. He loved those two bums. Um, so you know, to me, to my mind, that's what a cartoonist is. That's where I kind of always lean to. And that's what I love about Workman. You mentioned, um, you, you've mentioned business several times, Ralph, uh, from you know budgets of films and, and things like that. I wonder if you could talk a little more about how important that part of what you do is to the creative freedom of what you make, you know, like like being in control of budgets, being able to deliver this stuff on time, being conscious of the business part, which a lot of artists aren't. Good questions. Well, you know, you, you nailed it. That's everything. There is nothing without budget management. In other words, I get a million two dollars to do a film, you know, and I've got to bring that film in. And if I bring that film in, I finish that film. So it's critical that you set schedules and make sure the animators know what they're doing and fix the problems day in. It's a hard, hard, but you stay on top of it. Now, low budgets don't necessarily mean bad quality. It means you could try things that were never tried before because they're cheaper. For example, when I use photographic backgrounds in my film like Heavy Traffic, because they were cheaper to shoot, the painted backgrounds, they were more realistic, and they were fun to look at. Budget made me make that decision, because I could not afford to paint the, the entire city to the extent that it would, I would have had to. I just did not have the money. So sometimes creative freedom um, allows you to make choices that are better for the film, like live action cuts that really played well on the big screen, but also with nothing to, to, as far as costing any money, they were very cheap to the millions that Disney needed to produce some sort of massive effect on the screen. So low budgets gave me the right and the look to try stuff out of desperation, but out of desperation, you turn on your art knowledge and you do it from whatever creative thoughts you have, if you don't control the production flow, like I had a big problem from John Chris Lucci, that was the only thing he did wrong. Um, he did not care or want to care about the flow of work. Consequently, he always fell behind and always got into trouble. I can't tell you how many times I sat him down and told him, John, we barely got through Mighty Mouse, the first, the, the adventures, uh, because I wrote that myself personally. Uh, to young animators, unless you control production, you can't control your film. And if you can't control your film, you can't. You have nothing to control. Controlling production is the only way you're going to control your film. Uh, it's everything. If you don't take care of it, uh, you're not going to make it. 
the best guys in the business, Coppola, Scorsese, all the guys that I got to know uh, control their films. They know what they're doing. Production is everything. Tarantino. Uh, the guys that lost production, like the guys that did some very, like Bogdanovich did a film for $50 billion in, in some sort of pool, got fired from the industry altogether. Uh, other films, uh, Cleopatra in my day. If you lose control of production, you lose control of the film, you spend the fortune, and you probably get kicked out of the business. Um, so production, um, like it's like asking Ben Rockland to worry about color values. I mean, you know, or not to worry about how you put a, a, pre, a, a pre primer down on the canvas. It's ridiculous. Rockwell had that nail. That's why I was able to paint such beautiful pictures. Production is everything, <coughs> both cre for creative reasons and for just being able to complete reason. The question was about uh, rotoscoping. You you mentioned it earlier and said that uh, for budgetary reasons, you used it on Lord of the Rings. You don't care for it that much, but um, you and you use it in other places as well. Uh, does, to a layman like myself, I imagine that rotoscoping would have been a more expensive proposition because you have actors working it out. Um, but how, how, how is it uh, cheaper to do that? There are two reasons to use rotoscope, okay? Um, first of all, Lord of the Rings, the material in Lord of the Rings, and if you read the books, you know the amount of material that's in there, the amount of characters. You know, you have the fellowship at a minimum, which is nine or eight characters walking around the scene. You have horses, you have millions of orcs, you have vast vistas. I mean, you have a, you have you have a jam-packed, realistic, that's the way you see it, and that's the way I saw it, because I believed Lord of the Rings. Um, that's impossible to animate under any budgetary terms. If you got a hundred million dollars, it would still take you forty years to animate, and animators still can't do without without rotoscopes. Animators still can't do five horses with riders charging across the field. You can't do it. It doesn't work. Now, if you want to do a cartoon design, if you want to do something that's wrong for it, which I did not want to do, which is a UPA approach, it could be done. But it would not be Lord of the Rings to me. Lord of the Rings to me was Rembrandt and all this great Hackham and, you know, all these stuff. The only way to get it done physically is rotoscope, okay? But why rotoscope? Because rotoscope, you can trace the action. Now, um, also in Rotoscope, you don't have to be afraid of putting 15 or 20 horses on the screen. In real animation, you could put one on, maybe two. You can't put 15 or 20. You can't animate that many horses charging. You don't have the time or the expertise or the knowledge. So Rotoscope allows you not to, not to shirk on the amount of people in a scene or battle scenes or anything you need, okay? Number two, it's doable. Lord of the Rings was not doable in less than 10 years in straight animation. Nobody could have done it in less than 10 years. Live action, yes. Had I gone live action with it, I would have been satisfied. So you, you could get it done. There was no way to do it. There's no time frame or money enough for you to do it. You could not do it unless you butchered it. Well, I don't want to butcher it. I mean, you could butcher it. You could cut it 90% of the material out, change the design to characters. They call it Lord of the Rings. But that's not what I intended to do. That's not what I told Tol Tolkien's daughter I would do. So you hire actors and you, you, you budget it out and before we had a conversation, how much I knew about budgets, how important it is. And and I realized, I believe it or not, it was cheaper. It was cheaper to rotoscope higher actors that have animators sit there drawing it. I knew that. I knew that for my entire animation history. So all I had to do was get a budget that would allow me to rotoscope the picture. And I got 8 or $10 million for the first picture, and that was like, Six million more or four million more than I ever had. And also, I could do the realism 
And also I knew that Disney had rotoscoped uh, Vanable Mountain white and some of his real characters. He also used a rotoscope with realism is very difficult. And, and or virtually impossible to make it right. And animators need help. I mean, there's also good rotoscope and bad rotoscope. Good rotoscope is when the animator loosens up the photograph, gives it more of a quality than the like. Bad rotoscope is when he just traces the photograph. It becomes stiff and ugly. Well, half my guys knew how to do it, half my guys did not. Um, but it, I was able to do the film. Um, Ambi Palawada, who quit Disney to come to work for me, because he was an animator, but they only gave him assisting credit, uh, credits, because he was Milt Cole's assistant, and they didn't, never wanted him to leave Milt Cole's aside, so they gave him some animation to do, so he would go crazy. He was an old guy, so he actually quit. What he showed me was rotoscope photographs of Snow White, Night of Bull Mountain, and explained to me how it was done. My mouth dropped open. You know, I had thought that Disney had somehow animated all that stuff, and I found the realistic stuff. So I, so I had learned from Andy that realism could really work in rotoscope if it's done right. Uh, or I hoped it could work in rotoscope. I, I, uh, so I shot it and finished the movie. Um, um, I wasn't too happy with rotoscope. I, I, I it's not something animators enjoy, even if they can do it right. You know, it's the realism in animation is that kind of realism is a mistake in the sense. If I liked American Pop, um, um, that could have been done the other way. I, I'd always felt I made a mistake with Pop. Uh, I could have made it um, pure animation. Um, but you know, you also get trapped with rotoscope, and I was exhausted after all my fights and films. Uh, Rotoscope is an exact way to get uh, something to move. Um, animators don't have to be great to move something. So at a minimum, you get something to move. Um, and at that point in my career, I was pretty tired. Um, so that's the reason for rotoscope. Would I do it again? No. No. You, you mentioned a couple of filmmakers like from the 70s, like Martin Scorsese and Francis Coppola. And I've right. re read their peers of yours. Uh, you know, I wonder what those relationships were like if there were storytelling things you learned from them or storytelling conversations that you would have with them. Yeah. Uh, Coppola was a brilliant director. Coppola was very much, um, he had stars on his eyes. Coppola tried to open his own studio and he walked me through it. He bought, he had bought a place. Um, Coppola was very grandiose, saw things in a very big way, loved being a Italian, and when he got The Godfather to do, uh, it was in his wheelhouse. I mean, he knew those people, he loved those people. His choice of casting uh, on Pacino, who was a, who had just done Panic in Needle Park and Paramount on him was, was absolutely brilliant. His casting of Marlon Brando, who at that point in his career was an absolute uh, bum to everyone in town, was brilliant. Cope was a brilliant director. Um, he puts his, his heart into everything and he talks about that. He only died on a couple of now because he worked so hard. I think even one of his sons died in a crash there because he put so much energy into this telling of this Vietnam story. So Coppola was very grandiose, loved big parties, loved a lot of food, um, loved to be boss, but you didn't mind it with him because he deserved to be. He was very much a Mussolini with talent, and um, I loved him for it. Uh, he had a great cameraman who shot The Godfather, um, and uh, they got along very well. So Coppola was a very old school in character film director. He was from the old school directors um, back in Hollywood's heyday. Scorsese is very detailed, loves details, um, is a very nice guy, um, is very patient, is very bright, sits forever looking at movies, does not leave his house. He looks at one movie after another. He's probably seen every movie ever made. 
Um, he's a quiet guy. He doesn't care too much for women um, in the sense where they take up too much time um, away from movies. I mean, he's got all his time is spent on movies. Um, it's like, you know, me not letting stuff lie on the floor or keeping my drawings. He's, he's all about um, the history of movies and what they mean. And that's what his life's about. So he's, he's an artist. He's 100% an artist. Um, I was surprised that these guys hung with, allowed me to invite their parties and stuff. Obviously, uh, they must have liked what I was doing, but there was another animator in the place. Um, their work on, oh, their work on screenplays was critical to them. Um, their work on screenplays took years or forever. In other words, they rehearsed forever. How Scorsese would work is they would get a page from the writer, Monic Martin at that time, on Raging Bull, and then they would rehearse it with De Niro and the cast, but then they would start out living the pages, and then they would start taping the ad libs, and then they would retype the pages. In other words, Marty worked a lot, and here is the script, here are the pages. Now let's rehearse the, these pages. This is now once we have the idea of what these pages say and what these characters feel like. Now let's start ad libbing what they're saying so it could become more natural. And then once we get that done a couple of times, we tape that and retype the script. So that's the kind of way Scorsese worked. I thought that was sensational. I thought that was unbelievable because I was using and then started using more natural dialogues in my film where you just record people in rooms, um, real people like dock workers and um, whoever, you know, you, you, you know, uh, real, real people and then re uh, truck drivers, uh, construction workers, then let them talk, give them some give them a bottle of scotch while sitting on the table, tape their stuff and edit it, come up with great conversations and lines. So that's the way Marty worked. I thought that was absolutely extraordinary. Um, no one worked like that to that degree in live action at that time. That's a hell of a lot to learn. Um, do you do you take time to just do art for yourself? Oh, shit. Yeah. Um, ever since I left the business, um, first of all, I got burnt out. I got tired. There were too many fights. Um, I won a lot. I had done what I had to do. Um, I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, I was just tired, and um, I'm out. And so, so, it, but to, to me, the only reason I ever got into the business or any business was because I wanted to draw. I mean, going drawing was everything to me. And I also had learned so much over the years. You know, when I left art school, it was just cartooning. Comic strip artists were the greatest. By the time I finished my animation career. I learned about painters, all kinds of painters and all kinds of artists. You know, learning curve just increased. I'd learned them more. I'd gotten an education in art by studying various painters and artists and reading about art just to try to make my pictures better. I also spoke to hundreds of artists in my studio. I mean, some of the background artists I had were unbelievable. They could have gone out, they could have sold their stuff to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I was hanging around with hundreds of thousands of artists eventually that I'd learned something from. They were you know, artists, my friends, we spoke, we spoke about art. So coming back, what I wanted now, is I'd done as much as I could do. I, I screwed up a lot. I was a little depressed. I'd worked very hard and neglected my family at times uh, just for the sheer workload. Um, and all I wanted to do was paint and draw, which is where it all started. Um, and try to get better at that. And that has kept me busy every day uh, since I've quit animation. I paint and I draw and I put it away <laughs> next to the shelves. Sometimes I sell some. Sometimes I do some terrible ones. But I love to paint and draw. I do constructions. I do sculpture. Um, it's what it's all about everything, everything to an artist about just that. In other words, um, and having enough money to be able to do just that. We get by, and I made enough money in L.A. so I could do just that. 
If you have enough money to do just that, there's nothing else to do for an artist. Drawing is everything. Um, we die, all of us disappear from this planet. You know, drawing is what we're about. Um, fame is not what we're about. Glory is not what we're about. At least I'm not. I don't think you should be. That You're chasing that your whole life to a dead end. But if you love drawing and you draw every day, um, I am so satisfied. I'm such a lucky man. I mean, you remember, I grew up in a three-room apartment in Brooklyn with a back alley. It's the only window in the house. Be able to sit in New Mexico in my own studio painting and drawing with people still interested in my animation. My pictures are still playing, which shocked me all over the world. I mean, my wife, who takes care of the cell business and the art business, tells me that tons of people, all generations, are continuing to find my movie somehow and call me and email me. So that's kind of a win win, and I thought I had lost. Um, but drawing is everything. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and I, uh, if I couldn't eat, I would still draw. I think that's, um, you have to eat. That's very important. But other than that, it should, drawing should be next. If that's what you want. If you don't want that, you don't do it. I couldn't help wanting that. From the first time I tried to rob comic books from, uh, from ash cans or from, or from candy stores because I love the drawing. You know. Let me ask you a question. Okay, there was a book that I read, an underground book in the late 60s, early 70s, that was absolutely brilliant. I forgot the title. I can't remember it. It had, it was all in black and white, very scratchy drawings. It had to do with uh, a runaway railroad where a, lion, where a lion was running it. It was a railroad that took off. It had poems in it. Um, it had, um, you know, Plums, it has poems like Rocks in My Bed and Balls in My Head. It was absolutely brilliant. I met with the um, cartoonist at the time. I was thinking of doing something with him. But Hollywood scared the hell out of him when he took off. He was a very timid guy. He never did anything else. Um, uh, the, the, the last stories in the book were about these teenage kids running around some snow town trying to find girlfriends that they had lost. Um, also animals, a little bit like Fritz the Cat, uh, but not that well drawn, but very well drawn in a very strange sense. I'm looking for that book. I'm looking for that book. If any of your followers can find it, I'd appreciate it. That That is, uh, there's precedent for this, and uh, it doesn't ring a bell to me, but the somebody in the audience is going to know about it, and we will relay any and all information you. Uh, to you. I wish Absolutely. I could remember the name, but uh, it wasn't that big a deal then. But I'm telling you, you should read it if you find it. You should read it if you find it. Yeah, Ralph, you mentioned comic books a lot. Did you uh, come in contact with Jack Kirby's work? And if so, did you have any thoughts on Jack Kirby's comics? Jack Kirby, uh, Jack Kirby, I knew of, I knew about. From loving Boy Commandos when I was a young boy. I mean, I love Boy Commandos and I loved Captain America back in the late 40s, early 50s. Kirby came to my studio at the end. He was burnt out. He wanted a job in animation. I thought he'd be great for storyboards. But then he took a job at someplace else, I think maybe Hanna Barbera. Um, he was very disillusioned with comics because he had done so much and he was still broke. I was very sad. I loved meeting him. Um, uh, that's about it with Kirby. I mean, uh, that was my whole story. I was very happy meeting him. Um, I wish he had worked for me. Um, uh, but he did come to the studio and he wanted a job. So uh, we spoke for an hour about comics. And uh, he was not a happy camper about comic books. You know, but he's a brilliant artist. And uh, that was it. That was my Kirby story. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your time. I love talking to you. Your questions were great. You guys know what you're doing. If this was sensational. Email me and anything else you might want. Okay. Thanks so much, Ralph. This has been a pleasure. My pleasure. It's great. Ran into some technical difficulties. Had to, had to wrap the interview up uh, a few minutes short. But man, what an interview. What an honor and pleasure talking to Ralph Bakshi. You know, what an influence he has had on 
from mid 20th century on in terms of animation and storytelling and visual storytelling. And it was just terrific to get to talk to him. Um, wanna wanna give thanks out again to the Maui Comic Con. Uh, again, the 2020 Maui Comic Con, we were all slated to appear there. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a chance to meet up somewhere uh, in person and maybe in Maui uh, in 2021, but wanna thank them for arranging this and uh, let everybody know that that this year's show is canceled, but you can follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Maui Comic Con. Uh, they are a 501c3 nonprofit and they are accepting and collecting donations right now to kind of keep that, that convention afloat. So uh, if you enjoyed this, please consider that and, and certainly give them a follow um, you know, they've been spreading the comics love uh, to the 50th state. So uh, let's let's keep that strong. What were the other two questions that you wanted to ask? Uh, Ralph? I wanted to ask him about Alex Toth, another oh. cartoonist who, you know, ha has a significant body of work in animation. They seem stylistically very different, but you never know, you know, if their paths may have crossed somewhere. I would have been curious. And then uh, the other question I had is about political correctness. You know, so much of his work was was very radical in terms of, of uh, politics and content at the time. And uh, curious, you know, what thoughts he would have on that. Jim Valentino really put some ideas in my head regarding that, you know, like when he was describing the Vietnam era and growing up where it was like, you're going to turn 18 and then you go into the draft. Like, I just don't think about that as a reality. You know, you think of a birthday as something to look forward to. That was a tumultuous time. So Ralph Bakshi's work certainly addressed, uh, you know, those those topics and uh, political topics in general of that time period. So just curious to see if he had any thoughts on that. Let's uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, K Faber's like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon. Very important so that we can notify you when the new vids are available and it helps mitigate the uh, K Faber effect. So when we start talking about certain books. Got to check that video out fast and run to eBay, run to Amazon, run to your local comic shop because those comics, they become more expensive the next day. And speaking of kayfabe effect, we often talk about how great our audience is. I want to know what this book is that Ralph Bakshi is looking for. So please post a comment below the video if you have any insight or uh, information that could help us track that down. Um, be sure to subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up to date with everything that we have going on. Uh, you can find cartoonist kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video. Thanks for taking us to 19,000 uh, subscribers. I have to go edit this baby and get it ready for you to watch right now. How, me how meta is that, man? <laughs> this is me in the past talking to you in the present. <laughs> and, and at all times, remember, read more comics. <laughs>